Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for watching again. So, if you watched last week, you know that I was having a real rough time painting the pine needles in this mural that I'm doing for my daughter Zoe. And, uh, you know, when I'm having a hard time doing any particular aspect of a mural, man, it just consumes me. I, I mean, to the point of not sleeping well at night. And so, when I figured out a solution for this, this this week man was that a relief I was I, it just felt like a great personal victory and it's funny that that matters so much to me you know a great looking mural can be painted without details that small like little pine needles but I I had just gotten myself into it I you know once once I decide that I want to to figure out something. I have a really hard time letting it go. It's just my nature. And sometimes it's, it's a real problem, you know, because it causes me to not be able to switch gears uh, when I need to, when the work day's over and it's family time. But man, am I thankful nevertheless that, that uh, I found the solution. So this is what I ended up doing. On those pine needles, I took a foam brush, you know, there's those little foam brushes that you can get at any any craft store, I imagine, they just have a, a cheap wood handle and foam on the end, and they're shaped like a plunger. I took that, I heated up a razor blade, a, a, like, a, like a utility blade that you use for slicing plastic or boxes, and, and I heated it up so that it would really easily cut through that foam, and I, and I very meticulously cut little triangles all around the, that flat circle that is on that foam brush. And so I, I have video that you can see here of me, of me doing that. And that worked so well. I was so happy. Like when I first put that on the wall, I was like, yes, I have solved the problem, man. Oh man, I just can't tell you how much that just really was a relief to me. So. Uh, feel free to try this yourself, you know, as it, I think that it's a, a valuable trick. Now, as for the, the smaller pine tree, it's, I'm still, uh, still uh, looking for the best way to do that. Now, uh, A to the J had a real good uh, suggestion here, and he, he suggested using a stiff bristle hairbrush, like m more of a, uh, the kind of brush you use for cleaning. Uh, and I had even considered using a, a, the, uh, the one I saw in our kitchen, a round brush, you know, kind of shaped like, like a pipe cleaner with the bristles coming straight out. I mean, it, it looks like the pine needles. But the reason that, that that doesn't work so well is because it doesn't transfer the paint. So when you're looking for a good tool to paint with, you want to find a tool that not only is the shape that you're trying to reproduce on your surface but also does a good job at transferring paint so i've tried many things uh, for many different looks in painting and if it was if it was just as simple as just getting something shaped like those piney i just go and pick a branch off of a tree and just smack it on the wall <laughs> who knows maybe that would actually work good but it, since it doesn't absorb paint and then then it also doesn't put it onto the wall as well. So the nice thing about the foam brush was that it, it loads up the paint. I watered down the paint and then, you know, I can, I can cover some area with one load and that greatly reduces your overall time. And when you're painting a big picture, the, the time scale really matters. I mean, you know, you're really in it for some hours if, if you have to, you know, do one little dab, then dip, then one little dab, then dip. You know, you can really, really get into some, some exhaustive processes if if your tools don't put the paint on the wall really efficiently. Uh, that that worked really well. And then and then the next thing that I think was really valuable was getting the colors just right. So that was the same as I've done in, on any other tree. Having the colors. Of the of the tree, uh, you know, on almost everything I paint, I didn't really understand this as much a year or two ago. But 
as I, as I was doing uh, more instructional content on how to paint clouds, I was realizing, man, this, this principle of a transitionary color applies to almost every object in a picture for the, for the sole reason that paint, when it mixes, does not do what light does. So at the place where it's mixing, so you have your light color, your shadow color, at the place where it's mixing, that's where you need a color that is not simply the mix of the two colors because light in, in, out in nature is not doing the same thing that that paint is going to do when you mix it. So usually it's a loss of reddish colored hues in the paint when you mix any two colors. I mean, if, if you're going uh, orange and black or red and blue or, you know, you mix anything dark with anything light and it seems like it comes out greener than what it would if it was light. So typically my transitionary colors have more red in them because of that. But uh, in the case of a green tree, I don't want any red in there. So maybe I've been better off not to even say that about the red, but that's usually what it is when I'm doing, you know, like the rocks, the dirt, the tree trunks. However, with trees, you have a transitionary color and it is just the, the greenest green that's in the picture. So you have your dark shadow and, and in my how-to videos, I've used a black and blue mix a lot of the time because I like the way that color looks, that shadow in there looks, looks like something you would see outdoors where all of the shadows are affected by the blue color in the sky. Well, regardless of the color of that shadow, the, the next color you can see on my pine tree that I used a kind of a deep green that was pretty much just a blue and yellow mix because the blue is already very dark. It's like a phthalo blue. So just adding a little yellow gave me a really saturated but dark green. And, and then a little bit of white, uh, I lightened it. I did stages with that spongy, you know, pine needle tool that I made. I did layers where I did greener and greener until I started adding white to it that actually makes it less green. But this, this is my point, that everything follows this pattern of going from the shadows to the color to the highlights that again have less color. So that color in the middle always has the most color. So you go black to a green to a not so green that is your bright highlight. And I think the reason that's so common is because you know, white light shines on something, you're mixing colors again. Anytime you mix colors, you have less color altogether. When you, uh, you know, as, as, as you've seen in other videos, uh, when, you, when you mix the red and the green and the blue primaries of light, you, you just get your white computer screen, you get less color. Well, when you look outside and you see any kind of reflection, it's usually, two different colors, that one color reflecting off of a color that's not the same. So in my case, I, I have that, that real orangey colored earth that's at the base of my little stream. And, and then any color that reflects off that, you know, the, whether it's the green light of the forest or the blue light of the sky, those are, are different. And typically they are, you know, you have white light shining from the sky on some colored object. So, You'll, you'll have this very common pattern of most of the color being right where it's coming out of the shadow, but not on the brightest highlights. So when you're doing a painting, just uh, I think it's helpful to think in those terms of, I wanna, I wanna put my object coming out of the shadows. And trees really do this a lot, where it's a gradual transition. You have these thousands of little shapes that are leaves or needles, and they're coming out of the shadows. So you don't have a hard line where, where the light separates from the dark, typically. It's, it's something that's gradual. And, and then right where it's coming out, that's where all that color is. And then on the very tips where you have some reflection from more direct skylight or, or sunlight, whatever it is, then you actually have less of the green color. And so all of my things start looking more natural when I start applying that principle. It's something I get caught up in a lot is always wanting to master my paintbrush and use this this traditional way of painting 
and not take the time to rethink if I've got the best tool for the job. And you know, I remember this when I was on the paint crew, you know, you, you're on, on a timeline, you've got a deadline and, and you got to get a job done. And there's people on the crew that want to do things the slow way because it works, because they're good at it. You know, you'll, you'll see guys that have been painting for a long time and they're cutting in with the brush and they refuse to use tape in a situation where tape would genuinely make it go faster. That's not always the case. So don't get mad at me if you're that guy or you can just get mad, whatever. But I, I remember that it was a big deal, you know, somebody would just really, and, and this is myself so much of the time, I just love trying to master the, the, the craft. And I've got my paintbrush and I'm making my little pine branches and things and I forget to ask myself, is there a better tool that will make this easier? It's just a very simple question that sometimes I can forget to ask myself because I, I just get really into that process and love the idea that I can just make anything I want with that one paintbrush. Well, you know, exploring different, different tools and different techniques is a valuable thing. It really can, can save you time, it saves me a lot of time. So I ended up using carpet on, on that little tree when I got to the, the little pine tree. I still, I'm still, like I said, uh, thinking about if there's a better tool for that, but uh, I liked the way it turned out a lot better than my first attempts. And in the end, I think that it's really just the size of the shapes that are produced, more than the shape of the shapes that are produced, that, that make it look natural. I mean, you've got your size scale, and then you've got your color, and those two things combined really do a good job of telling the story and making the picture what you want it to be. So the accuracy of the roundness of those little pine needle shapes that I'm trying to get, I think is not nearly as important as, as those other two things. So then when I got down, when I, when I finally was having success with those pine needles, then that's when it was time to, to really think about, okay, is this tree laid out just the way I want? I do that a lot where where I just need to get the foreground figured out and then I'll start messing with the composition of the background and how things are laid out. So then I start painting the negative space. And so there's one point in there where I took the bright green and, and just put it over some of the dark pine needles I had painted. And then I also took a bluer shadow color and replaced the color that was the shadow on that big rock behind my my what's going to be a, an aspen tree curving up in that picture I, i've got a big rock behind that well i flip-flopped the values so that i turned that white tree trunk darker than the shadow that's behind it and then i took the shadow behind it and made it bluer just because i know that, that that's an easy trick to remember is if you make it bluer and grayer it goes back that that's just a, a pretty simple thing. It may not be always true, but it's it's uh, really helped my picture many times just by using that trick. When I want some atmosphere to just look more distant, I just go bluer and grayer. So I did that with that shadow, and I liked the way it turned out, putting a dark shadow on the top of that tree trunk where those pine needles are hanging over it. So the next step will be to, to put the rough kind of splitting and, and cracked apart bark that is on that lower area of the tree. I didn't get to that. Abby M says, beautiful Joe, thanks for posting and taking us through all the aspects. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your lovely family. God bless Joe. Thank you very much, Abby. That's very nice and happy Thanksgiving to you and everyone else watching too. Uh, that's why I didn't have audio on this. That's why I'm talking here instead of there. Man, our house is full. We got all kinds of noises in there and I didn't really want to post every single conversation that floats in the door on a YouTube video. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing it this way. Thank you, Gabri G, for that nice compliment. Michael Hendrickson says, I really love the progress of this mural. I love all the colors in your explanations on how you achieve all the movements and reflections. It was incredibly well done. I thank you, Michael, for that nice compliment. Thank you very much. Hello from Sweden. Love your videos, says Indus. 
Have you thought about trying something like a worn fan brush for the pine needles? I did think of that. Thank you for the suggestion. And uh, you know, the once the foam thing worked, I just I was ready to settle for that one. But maybe the fan, you know, anybody that wants to try try other uh, methods, I think that's a real good idea. Johnny Torre, Torres says, "Muy bien, video gracias." Okay, so when I got to the the branches that are in the shadows of the tree, this is something that I've used a lot in other murals, where it's actually easier to paint the branches after I paint all of the foliage on the tree. So you naturally think of, when, you, when you're painting, it's natural to think of building it from the furthest things to the closest things, background to foreground, or work from the middle to the outside. It's, it's easy to, to naturally think of it that way, but I have found it to be a lot more efficient on time to do just the opposite a lot of, a lot of the time, not always. Well, on trees, it's easier for me to make a bunch of clusters of foliage in places where I think they look good in the picture and then put the branches in where where my eye is taking me after looking at that. Like, oh, it looks like a branch could be coming down here right under this bunch of pine needles. So that's exactly what I did. You know, I, I feel like on a tree that my, my main goal was to get get those pine needles and that foliage looking just the right color. So I do that first because that's my priority. And then I'll just do the branches to fit that. And so once I have that in place, then I have a darkness, a value that I can put into my, into my branches to make them look like they fit in there. And it's easier for me to match those shadowed branches to the green than it is for me to try to make the green look appropriate for for the the other way around. I, I don't know. That's that's just my preference, I guess. Well, so it allows me to do a minimal amount of tedious detail with little branches and things by both painting the shapes of negative space and then by just filling in the branches in between those clusters. And you, you could see that I lost a lot of my detailed needly edges that I had put in, but it's easy to redo those. I'll just grab that little brush and do it again. But I was able to just put the shadow in and then add yellow to the black to get a real greenish color. And, and that's a good trick to do when you, when you wanna make the branches just disappear into the shadows, you can gradually add more of the color of the, the foliage of the tree. So if they were yellow leaves, like on an on a aspen tree in the fall, then I might add a lot more yellow to it as it's going into the shadows of all those leaves. Well, on this pine tree, it was that deep green. Well, I knew if I just add yellow to the black, it's gonna get greener. So that's a that's an easier thing to do than meticulously dividing up each branch into smaller branches and then those branches into smaller branches to decide where they should go on that tree. You know, the less detail that you do, the more of a viewer's imagination will fill in detail. You know, your imagination just needs you to not put wrong details in the way. So if you can just avoid doing things that are eyesores in a picture, then you can do hardly anything at all and have a great looking picture if you want to. So I've, I've seen really impressionistic paintings that I thought did an excellent job of capturing the essence of something and causing, in my mind, that, that's the best impressionistic painting is something that causes my imagination to see it without the picture showing it to me because the artist, you know, intentionally painted the exact thing that is showing me and you know if I, my imagination does it my imagination does it right according to, to my standards you know if your imagination fills in something it doesn't fill it in with wrong details it fills it in with what you want to see so use imagination in your pictures just a gray atmosphere behind branches sometimes is the best thing for the picture because just that with the slightest bit of a little color here and there 
looks like edges of trees and distant things that, that are taking the colors from the mural and going into the distance. And you just imagine it. It's, when, when I'm painting a horizon, it's that little half of a centimeter of a width line that goes across that horizon that represents a hundred miles of ocean or, or miles of grassy plains and you just put a couple little trees on that and the way that ties the foreground to the horizon, it's amazing the effect it has. So my point is that the viewer's imagination fills in the details. The amount of things that we can see in nature it is very hard to duplicate in a painting and that can be discouraging at, at times when, you, when you're trying to think of I got to put all this detail in this painting, I got to paint this really detailed concept. But it's good to remember that sometimes if you just put the colors that are really in that thing in these key places, then you can cause imagination to fill in the rest. Jennifer Perez says, hey Joe, great work as always. Just a reminder, remember to put in Zoe's hawk, she asked for. I remember seeing you draw it, but haven't seen you paint one in yet. Love seeing the kids. They are so cute and adorable. Blessings for you and your family. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much, Jennifer, because I, I wasn't even gonna do it. So I painted the branch in where the, the hawk is gonna be sitting. I didn't get to starting the hawk yet, but now I've got that branch that looks out of place right now <laughs> until I put more, more things in there to accompany it. So that's gonna remind me to get that hawk in here. Let's see, what else can we say about this mural? I think that, I think that's enough of me jibber jabbering about this. I think, the best, the best value I can offer is probably just answering questions that come in. I've found in my learning, in my learning process, that if I have a question that I've formed based on something that I have a real sense of need for, for the knowledge. So not just a question, just to have a question. Uh, not that those are bad, but when you have a question, like, like, um, like I, I, I want to know how that looked like a three-dimensional object when you added that one color to it. Okay, so I'm just trying to come up with a generic example. Targeted questions like that that are based on I want to know so that I can do it and a, a kind of a sense of need. Those are like a folder in your brain that's ready to be filed for later access because you know you get the answer and you're like oh that's the answer and then you have a sense of of uh, relief for a moment that you've got that you've got that task accomplished of getting that answer you were looking for and for some reason that process files it in your mind in a way that you can access it later whereas if you just are given information that's not satisfying a a void, you know, kind kind of kind of a hunger for knowledge that you've actually acquired. Well, it's harder to access that information later because it doesn't have context, it doesn't have relevance, it's not attached to something else to be in in, in this organized accessible place in your mind. Okay, so this is just my theory, but it's something that I've found is helpful for me, knowing that when I approach something and I, I'm feeling overwhelmed at the task of it because there's so much I don't understand, I've gained a certain confidence about everything that I strive to learn now because I, I, have, I, I have confidence that the questions are going to get me there, that the answer is there and I just need to find the right question and then I'm here and I just got to get around this obstacle, I just got to figure out how this happens and I know that that's going to take me to another place and I'm not as overwhelmed by everything I don't know anymore. It's become a lot more of a thrill for me, uh, especially like in the case of trying to do these pine needles. It, it's, uh, I, I just knew from the beginning, you see, I never doubted that I was going to find a way to do those pine needles just the way I wanted them to be. I never doubted that. But my need 
for control and my impatience is the source of frustration. I want it now. I need to get done. You know, it's that drive that, that makes me do what I do. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. But, but I think that we can all have that confidence that the questions are going to get you there. Look for the answer with the confidence that the answer is out there and that you are not unable to understand the answer that you need. Timothy McDougall says, your son knows the word paint. Very adorable. Thank you. He is adorable, isn't he? Okay, he says, oh, look at that little guy. Now, I appreciate this comment by Mac Nicholson. I love that you use black. As a tonalist, I feel I can't do serious realism without it. Now, I agree with that. I am curious about what tonalism me, I, uh, you know, tell, tell me what, what exactly you mean by tonalist because I don't want to get that wrong. But I imagine tone to be uh, lightness and darkness, but that, that's the first thing that comes to mind is rather than colors of the rainbow, I'm thinking of lightness and darkness. But anyway, uh, I definitely appreciate that comment about black because uh, as I was as I was studying my earlier pieces, thinking, well, how can how can I make what's missing to make that look like it's it's more lifelike? I want it to be more lifelike. What's missing? And I'm comparing my flat wall picture to the real things I'm seeing, and I just began to notice my darks are not as dark. They've got to get darker. My my black on the wall was a mix of red, yellow, and blue just to get a colorless dark colorless dark dark uh, a shade but that doesn't get as dark as black and it it makes some cool looking shadows you have some color and shadows but now i always use black for those few shadows that are that are the darkest in my picture i always go all the way if i can i like to go all the way from a true black to a or I shouldn't say true black from the blackest black that I can that I can get to the whitest white that I can get and I try to to put any picture I paint covering that whole range because a real shadow is a very dark thing and a, a lot of the time what looks wrong about it in a picture when black it is not successful is is simply that other colors mixed with it doing what paint does and not resembling light mixing. It did what paint does when it mixes and created hues that shouldn't exist in that scene. So use black for your darkest shadows and remember that you need the transitionary color to come out of the black shadow to make the lights look more natural. That was the key for me to move to more three-dimensional looking pictures was getting that all the way black shadow and understanding how to get the light to, to mix with that black in a natural way and still have a nice, nice looking picture that didn't look colorless. You know, I, I, I remember, you know, I should, I should use this picture in a video that I painted of my wife and my daughter. And I, I was not aware of this concept of a transitionary color. And this, this was pre, pre, um, me researching it. Well, that would be a good video, actually. I think I'm going to do that. It happens with portraits so much because with people you have, and that's a subject I, I definitely need to do more of, and I am going to. With people, you have the transitionary color is even more colorful because the saturated red tone that's in the middle of the light and the shadow is both from just the natural light mixing as well as the red blood that, that is in skin or the pigment in skin that's getting lit up from the light because even dark skin has translucency to it and, and gets a little bit different hue when sunlight blasts through it. So you always have that colored area in between the light and the shadow. All right, let's wrap this up with just a couple more comments. Brian Mullen is is saying uh, it's kind of a long comment so I'll, I'll just say that uh, Brian Mullen is saying I learned in the billboard scenic painting business to have about four to six colors going in cans and he's saying that uh, that process resulted in a lot of different colors 
uh, slightly different colors than the originals in the touch-up process. And uh, I, I totally relate to that. You, you know, pre-mixing colors is a valuable thing. It can really save you on time. And in a lot of my videos, you'll see me working straight from primaries direct to the wall. I do that because I can and because it's an easy way to get a picture put together. I do move to pre-mixing batches of color as I move along and a lot of the times I'll mix them from those primary colors. But don't get me wrong about primary colors. There's a lot of colors that can't be made with any set of primaries. Whatever you choose for primaries, you can't make every color that's in between those. So primary really just means a color that you can't make. But it, my point in saying that is that there is value to bringing in all kinds of different secondary colors because you just can't mix them that bright with your red, yellow, and blue. Or, you know, like in my case, I like to use red, yellow, and blue. When I'm, when I'm mixing batches of color, when I'm pre-mixing, I, I try to keep it as simple as possible. It's, it's really good to have the, the minimal amount so that it's easy for me to quickly match up colors. So you can see in a lot of places in this mural, I have a yellow, black, red, and white mix. And I just know that, you know, I've done it enough times on the wall. I know if I need to match it, oh yeah, that's my mix that's like that. I do the black, I put the yellow, I put the white, and I get my match pretty quickly. It's nice to, to know as soon as you see a color exactly where it came from and not have to refer back to, to uh, an exact mix that you did plus another mix that you did. You know, you had a little of this mix and a little of this mix and who knows what it ends up being after that combination is put together. So I, I recommend trying to be really familiar with the multiple different ways there are to mix a color. That, that can be a really valuable thing. Just because you can make a grayish color from yet red, yellow, blue, and white doesn't mean that that's your best option because it may be a lot easier for you to, to just use black and white and then be able to match that up later very quickly. Or, you know, a lot of my greens I'll use, I'll decide whether I'm gonna use blue and yellow or am I gonna use black and yellow. Now I could take the blue and yellow and just add red to get it to, to the same kind of color as if I use black and yellow and a little bit of white. I can do the same thing. But the if I'm, if I'm gonna mix uh, those, those three primaries, those red, yellow, and blue, that's gonna be harder for me to, to match up a color like that later than it will be if I know I just need black and yellow and then lighten it or darken it to where I need it to be. So knowing that there are different ways to mix colors and having your, having your starting set as small as possible. But I always bring in those brighter secondary colors when they're needed for the accent. Terry Wormuth, Wormuth says, you're killing me, smashed it on the hood of my car, quoting me. Thanks for the laugh. And thank you, uh, Terry, for the nice compliment. Well, that, you know, I, I taped it down on the hood of my car, let that brush, this was the brush, if you didn't watch it, that, that I was trying to use to paint the pine needles last time. And the problem was, when I pulled it off the hood of my car and it had dried in the sun, all the bristles were shooting straight out, just perfect, you know, and, and it worked for just a couple, a couple runs, but then the bristles were not glued into the, into the brush that way. And, and once I added water and paint, it started losing its shape and it didn't, didn't work out for me. So if a brush was specifically designed like that, which I think I've actually seen brushes that are designed with that shape, but I ended up needing something that had more divided bristles, you know, just so the foam ended up working out, working out better. My uh, idea of smashing it on the hood of the car wasn't the best idea. How do you measure how good an idea is? I, I guess, you know, uh, I think it should be measured by where you ended up because of the process you went through rather than whether or not the idea itself worked. So I'm going to stop right there and uh, call it a wrap for today. This is a little bit different format because I don't have my brother Ben to edit the video for me because he, you know, he's got Thanksgiving plans too. So 
I want to thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Oh yeah, and happy Thanksgiving.